All right, everybody, we're going to get started with our Cuba mission trip presentation. And we get a click. So uh, we've been waiting to tell this uh, story of what God has done in Cuba. It was an amazing time. Um, but before we do anything, let me go ahead and open us up in prayer. And then uh, we'll dig right in. Father, thank you so much. Um, for the opportunity to continue just to praise you and to share with others what you are doing all over the world. Lord, specifically, we thank you for Cuba and the people there, the, the way that you grew us as we were able to share the gospel with others, the way that we saw you move. I pray, Lord, that you give us clear minds and, Lord, help us to boldly declare what you've done. Lord, help us to not be nervous up here, but, Lord, again, just trust in your power and what you've done there and what you can do here. Lord, I pray that as we share uh, this testimony, this story of what you've done, Lord, that our church would be encouraged and motivated to continue to do more. And it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. All right, so we're really excited to talk to you this morning about our Cuba mission uh, trip to uh, Havana, Cuba, uh, in July. Um, we went to an organization called Filter of Hope, and... Um, you might ask, why did we decide to go with Filter of Hope? Um, so I'm going to show you a quick video so we can collectively take a breath up here and be ready uh, about what Filter of Hope is all about and uh, why we decided to go with them. Water. It can keep you healthy. make you sick. Those who have clean water take it for granted. Those who don't have it would give anything for it. It's the most precious resource on the planet. The lack of clean drinking water is the largest killer on earth, affecting almost one out of eight people. Every day, Kids miss school, people walk for miles to find clean water, and more than 3,000 people die. Safe water is at our fingertips, but for many, it might as well be a million miles away. But it doesn't have to be this way. Filter of Hope has developed a revolutionary, point-of-use water filter that is saving lives. It can provide up to 200 gallons of clean water per day and can last 10 years with very little maintenance. It's inexpensive and easy to use. They're small enough that we can pack several in a backpack, walk into a community, and in a few minutes, provide the entire neighborhood with clean water. Not only does Filter of Hope provide clean water, but we also use the filter as a physical illustration of the gospel. The filters are inexpensive, easy to use, and a powerful tool to change lives, both physically and spiritually. Will you help give life to a family in need? So, uh, to be completely honest, I've been to, I have been to Cuba before, I've been to different places where you're not supposed to drink the water, but it, it never really affected me that much. I always was provided with bottled water. I didn't really think about it. Now and then I'd get a little bug, but it didn't impact me until I really went on this trip and, and saw the conditions and, and then experienced the conditions like we all did um, of what not having clean water can do. Um, so that's why we went, not only be, to provide the physical need, but I, there's is one of the best illustrations of the gospel that I've, I've ever done practically. Um, and, and people can see it, people from different cultures, they understand it. And so we decided to go with Filter of Hope, and we went. And so let's jump right into our trip now. Day one um, was a day of travel and training. And um, how many of you up here, was this your first time on a plane? So not only, how many of you was this first time out of the country? 
So first time flying, first time out of the country. Let's go to a communist, nearly th third world country. You know, good, <laughs> good choice. So I have a question for you all up here. What were your thoughts and expectations prior to going? As you're on this plane right here, what's going through your head um, as we begin to go to Cuba? Who wants to start us? So my thoughts, hello. What's up? All right. So my thoughts were just of uh, nerves for everybody. Because a lot of people, like you were saying, first time flying, first time out of country, first time sharing the gospel, first time meeting people that are from a different, uh, have a different native language. So just uh, being able to watch and how they react to what they're doing. Anybody else? What were your thoughts or expectations? So what was going through my mind was when I get there, um, since these people have nothing, will I, try, will I get stolen from? You know, will, I mean, unintention, I never meant it like in a bad way, but when I got there, the people were just so incredibly kind. It like blew my expectations out of the water. Like you, you might expect people who have nothing to kind of be defensive and kind of just be kept to themselves, but they were just the most kind and welcoming and friendly people you've ever seen. Another expectation I had was that since it was in such great poverty, I just expected completely run down, dirty water lakes, and I didn't expect to find any beauty, but even in the wreckage, there was beauty to be found, beauty within the people and their talents, and just the remainders of their houses. I mean, one person had a house that had been in her family for 80 years. Okay, so yeah. Anyone else? One more. Thoughts, expectations. Andrew? I thought, like, going into it, like, we were going to be, like, strangers in a place. And uh, it ended up not being like that. Like, the people there, they all, like, welcomed us. And, like, really, they didn't really question, like, what we were giving them. They really, like, could, like, see what it meant to us. And I think it was really special. Yeah, that's, that's great. And so day one, we, we, gave, we went in with a lot of excitement, a lot of um, anticipation, it, even more, we got to the airport, I thought on time, but the guy at the, the desk checking us in was, he needed a cup of coffee, and uh, we got on the plane, we hurried up, and then we had to wait because the faucet on the plane was broken, so we <laughs> just stayed in Greensboro for an extra hour. Uh, we got down there, we met um, our, our Filter of Hope liaison, um, and uh, he gave us some training, and, and uh, we ate some really good food, and um, then we went to bed, ready for the next day. Because that next day, uh, we went to church, and we jumped right in in the afternoon um, to do some distribution of our filters and sharing the gospel. And so um, I don't think most of y'all can see this, but here's a, a picture of our breakfast, if y'all can see that. Um, they would cook from scratch our breakfast, lunch, and dinner uh, nearly every night unless we went out to, to eat. Um, and this is a big deal because it's really hard to get any food in Cuba. Everything is rationed. Uh, does someone remember what the price of eggs was? Go ahead, Pam. Well, that was what I was going to say. The first night kind of set the tone for the whole week. Yeah. When we sat down to dinner, um, Ida who was one of our uh, guides and leaders for the Cuban uh, people, um, told us that the house staff, and there were about, what, seven, six or seven on the yeah. staff, um, they fixed our meals and, and cleaned for us and everything. They were awesome all week long. Didn't speak English, and um, we found that out later. <laughs> but she told us that first night they had been hoarding food for us, the 20 of us, plus the van drivers, plus Ida and Adrian and Raphael, and they had been hoarding food for two months for us. Now, that may not sound like much. I mean, when it storms, we go out and buy all the bread in the store and the milk and everything else. But for them, they are rationed food. There isn't a grocery store on every corner. I mean, I didn't see any grocery stores while we were there. 
Um, they get their food from the government, and it's once a month. And now, in the last few years, it's even longer. And just because they're in line to get that food, to get their rations, doesn't mean they will get it. They could be the first one in line, and they may not have it. It may not be available. Things are rationed like rice, beans, all of which we had for our meals during the week for lunch and for dinner, um, eggs, cooking oil, um, I'm assuming milk products. We didn't have any milk for the week, but we did have for breakfast one little one inch square flat of cheese and one little flat one inch square of, I guess, ham or bologna or something, some kind of meat. And our eggs, we had just a little circle of eggs and two pieces of toast for breakfast. No butter, I didn't see any butter all week. And, um, but everything is rationed, sugar is rationed. I didn't see anything breaded. We didn't have anything breaded, so I'm assuming flour was also in that. Anything you would go to the grocery store for is rationed. Not only that, but um, through the week we found out other things. Salaries, they get 10% of their salary, everything else goes to the government. Um, pharmaceuticals are, uh, you get those through the hospital. The hospital has the pharmacies. You don't see a CVS, a Revco, a Walgreens, they don't exist there. And um, medications are hard to come by, not because they can't afford them, but because they're not available. The hospitals can't get them. And Jamie, I'm sure we'll have something to say about Aliana yes. in a little yeah. bit. Yeah. And, yeah. But that was, think about giving a portion of your meal to someone you don't know. Saving food for two months out of your meals for people you've never met before. That hit me. I've never had anyone give up food. They were taken out of their rations. They weren't given extra rations for all of us. What we ate came out of their rations, those seven people. I, I think that is, that's God, that's a God thing. Yeah, it speaks of their hospitality, but also the importance of why we're there. And they knew it. And, 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 and God is moving in Cuba. I, we went to church that morning after breakfast, and, and the first thing we were greeted with was multiple baptisms. And um, we went to this church, and it, it, it was packed. I mean, it was standing room only, and they had an overflow room where we went upstairs so that the, the message could be translated to us. Um, anybody want to speak of the worship service? I know some of you really enjoyed that. Yes, Andy? Well, one of the things that really struck me is I, I sort of pictured you know, old-timey, you know, people. They were all the songs were contemporary songs. All but a, one of them we recognized. We we recognized the tune of these songs. They sang "Oceans," which we heard about five different versions of during our trip. Some English, some Spanish, and so I mean we were able to sing along because they had the words up on screens just like we did. This was a this was a big church, and and there was just such a spirit uh, of worship. They had this young praise team. And it just felt so contemporary, and I think I'd, that surprised me, just the contemporary nature of it. And, and they were all so excited to see us. I think Zoe wanted to say something. So along with the contemporary, there were just a huge diversity of ages and generations. And a lot of times, you know, here we would have families. And over there, they did have some families, but it was a lot of just two people, two people everywhere. And it was just really kind of cool to see how their church was all connected and they were like a big family. And just the generosity of the people, I mean, again and again, no matter where we went, the people were just so kind. And the message was very, very good that he gave. It, he was talking about, um, how even though Christ frees us, when we are in sin, we can still be enslaved 
to our desires. And I just think it was so powerful that we were greeted, like it was a God thing that we were greeted with that message. Like we're here on a mission trip to go to Cuba, but if we're in it for ourselves, then we're not in it because God has called us to or because we're doing it for God's glory, then we might as well have not went. Sorry. So like Jamie was saying, we started off with baptism and we thought it was interesting. So we have our baptistry, we raise the screen, it's open here, and we see him walk down. So he has a little curtain pulled, so they slide the curtain back, and here's the, one of the pastors and whoever's getting baptized, they do the baptism, and somebody has to reach over and pull the little curtain back. And yeah, it, could, it could have been a puppet show. I had it, no idea what was going on. It could on. have been. We were kind of confused what was going on, but they would do a baptism, sing a song, somebody else get baptized, sing a song. A couple got baptized together. They sang another. It was just back and forth. We found out later that a couple of the folks that were getting baptized that day, they had been recipients of these water filters in like January. So over the course of a few months, they had been given these water filters, had been presented the gospel, had received Jesus, and been discipled by the church to the point that six months later, they're now getting baptized. So everybody says, oh great, you went and gave water filters. Nice. Well, this was a direct product to show us this is what's going to happen this week. It was like God was saying, folks, pay attention. This is going to happen. Not just, oh, we hope. This is going to happen. Uh, so I think another big point would be if you look, there's a lot of people in this church, but there's not a lot of churches. You, how, I think we traveled probably 20 plus minutes just to get to this church and then 40 plus minutes to get to the church where we went to the neighborhood to serve. So they're not very common like here where you can go down the road and you find another good quality church, another good quality church, another good quality church all within like 10 minutes of each other. You're traveling 20 minutes, 40 minutes. And so the fact that they're bringing in all these people just shows the dedication that the people have to be in the church. Yeah, I thought it was cool because oftentimes at churches in America, you see people who just come to church just to be at church. It's just a part of something they do on Sundays. But in Cuba, you had to make an effort, and, like, it's just not something that you do. It's, like, it's not normal. And you, the people that were at this church, they were, like, it's true worship. It wasn't just something that they were, they felt they had to be there for. It's just a uh, cultural obligation. But they were there, and they, like, it was true worship from every single soul in that church. Yeah, it was it was really really good experience. And we got three sermons because we had one in Spanish and then two translators that were slightly different. <laughs> and so, but uh, to to Zoe's point earlier, it was a very good message. And and part of that is because right next to the church, there's this seminary. Um, it's the uh, it's, in, in all actuality, it's it's connected with North Carolina Baptist. And so uh, it's not Southern Baptist per se, but we have a big part to do with the, the seminary education over there. And the pastor of that church was educated here at that seminary. It's literally next door. And so um, it, it was a great, um, a, a great time to, to listen, to worship. Um, here's a view looking back from the seminary over Havana. Um, it's just beautiful. You can see the Capitol building there in the distance. Um, and so we went, we had church, we worshiped, we were fired up, we came back, had lunch. So 20 minutes there, then 40 minutes, and we went to a different part of Havana, and we went to this church called Reina Ser. Uh, Reina Ser, what's it mean, guys? Reborn, right? reborn church and so or, or new birth church or something like that um, and uh, it's just this small corner church um, and, and you can see uh, in the middle on um, the I don't know that's my right side your left side. on one of those sides in, in the middle is the pastor and his wife and then we have two of our uh, interpreter or one of our interpreters and one of our guides the guide there uh, who's holding the black umbrella, that's Eliana. Um, Pam was talking about her. I'll give you a quick story about Eliana. Uh, she's been in that area, in this neighborhood, for a long time. Um, again, this neighborhood, is I, you can start getting the glimpse, it's not very um, rich by any means. 
And yet in Eliana's backyard, through years of preparations, she's made it a place where 35 people can have a Bible study in her backyard. And it was beautiful. Um, speaking of the medicine, Eliana is going through breast cancer. And she had to go to the hospital um, to receive treatment, but there wasn't enough medicine. Uh, and, and it just, it, it's just, it's heartbreaking. And um, Pam and, uh, and Eliana, you kind of had a, some stories in common. You, sh- you shared about your daughter and her daughter, correct? You want to share a little bit about that? Eliana has a daughter who, um, while she was pregnant, they decided that she was going to have a Downs child and that she should terminate the pregnancy. And she said, no, no, there's nothing wrong with this child. I'm trusting in the God in heaven, and there is nothing wrong with this child. And this was early on in the pregnancy, and she just continued. She wouldn't let them do anything. They did the ambiocentesis and, and you know, said, no, there's, there's something wrong with the baby. You know, you need to give it up. You need to um, have an abortion. You need to get rid of this child. No, no, God will take care of this. My child will be perfect. And sure enough, and she had her family, uh, Eliana, her mother. Her mother lives with Eliana. Um, they were all praying, and they are all God-fearing women and, I mean, just angels. They're, they're just amazing women. And when that baby was born, perfect, perfect. There wasn't a thing wrong with that child. And, you know, God took care of it. Um, I'm not going to go into all the story with mine, but um, did you, when we were taking our picture on the steps of the seminary, did you get the translation of the, right above our heads, it says, pray to God of the harvest that he will send harvesters for him. So I thought that was appropriate and, and, you know, I, we didn't know what it said until we left there. <laughs> Google Translate when we got internet. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, it was amazing. We had no idea what was going to happen. Um, so this is the outside of the church. Here's the inside of the church. Uh, they just ha- got done with the Breaker Rock <laughs> Beach VBS. And so, Dan, you, you're happy out there. Um, and so it, it, this is it. Like, I don't think you can understand how, how cramped it was maybe – no, that's not the right one. So it, it, it's just small, and it's packed out with the people. Um, and so we met there. We met with, uh, they, they assigned us to guides and uh, interpreters, and we had five teams um, that went out, and then we started doing some distribution. And so here's uh, a distribution team, and... Uh, Israel, you want to talk about this one a little bit since I see you there? So this was our first distribution uh, for the first day. And in my, in my mind, it was probably the best for me, and I think probably for Angela as well. But uh, <clears throat> they had uh, two daughters. One had epilepsy, and um, the... We walk through there, and the first thing you come to is a bed, child's bed on the ground. And uh, you walk through the next room, and they have a queen-size bed frame and two dressers. No bed in the bed frame, just, a, uh, just the frame. So we talked to them in their, uh, in their kitchen. Um, I think uh, Angela and Ethan prepped the filter and you know talked about the filter. And... Um, and then I gave the gospel, and I put my testimony into that. So in the beginning of doing this, the, the husband, he didn't really want to have anything to do with it. He was going in and out. And uh, by the time we were done, he, uh, he would not let go of my neck. He was crying and hugging me with what we were sharing with him and his family. So these are the first two for our group that uh, committed their, their lives to Jesus. Um, and then we found out later that the church was praying for that husband, and it was an answer to their prayer. 
Yeah, it was not a short time either. It was it was years, if I'm. Yes, it has been a while. Yeah. So um, you heard Israel talk about uh, the the preparing the filter and all that, and and so we wanted to give you a demonstration of of what we did. And so Cindy and Philip, and were you going to go over there and and do it? So do it over here, or we're going to move the table. Uh, we'll bring it over there, okay. so so everybody can see it. So give us one second. While they're moving that around, if you saw the one picture overlooking downtown area, you saw all these tanks on top of the buildings. So every building, they have some type of a barrel, water tank, something. So when, when the water is turned on, they pump water into this tank and it's all gravity fed. So we were have actually visiting one house toward the end of our time there and we heard water flowing freely. I thought, what is that? We saw water running off a rooftop, then it stopped. Well, the lady we're talking to, she reaches over and flips a switch on the wall on the front porch, and a little pump turns on, and it's pumping water into that tank. Well, we heard water running off our roof, and right in the middle of talking, she reaches over and flips the switch off. So it's not guaranteed that the water is even going to be on, so they pump in the water into these storage tanks when they know it's available just to conserve the water. Um, going back on what Ben said, like we used to have that system in India where they keep big water tanks on top so that in case water doesn't come, you use the water which we have stored up. But in Cuba, it's a bit different. In India, you usually have water for 12 hours and then don't have water for another 12 hours. So like within a day, you'll have water and then you won't have water. In Cuba, it's like they'll have water for one day, then two days they might not have water. And it's like completely uh, unpredictable when the water would come and when the water would go. Um, the place where we were in, they had water tanks, but the place where we shared the gospel, they did not even have water tanks to, you know, store the water and keep it. So like one day they'll have water, two days they won't have water at all. And they'll have like mini buckets where they used to save up the water and like be um, very cautious in how they use the water. All right. So we, the, the people we went to visit had already requested water filters and they'd been reached, um, ha, had been contacted by the church. The, the people in the church had really done a, laid a lot of work. They had, they had built relationships with these people. So we would go to their houses and say, we're here to give you two gifts. The first one is a water filter. Do you have a bucket? And so they would bring buckets of all different sizes, shapes, dirty, you know, giant yogurt containers, all kinds of things. We would demonstrate how to, how to drill a hole and, and put the filter together. We're not showing you that part. But the filter is, it's this big, smaller than, smaller than a, a soda can. And it works, as, as Ben mentioned, by gravity. And the technology used in these filters is the same technology used in, um, in kidney dialysis. So it filters out the, the tiniest, tiniest of particles. So um, one of the things we do is say, okay, there's things in your water you can't see, but now we're gonna put some things in your water that you can see. And we'd say that too. Say, who wants some of this water? You wanna drink some? Of course, the answer was always no. They did not want that water. Uh, so we showed them how to put the filter together. Do you want to pour the first one? So, and again, it, it works by gravity. So you don't need any kind of batteries, pumps, nothing to get the water. It's coming out. You see how dirty it is here? It's coming out clear. We talk about this water and how, oh, first, somebody on our team would always taste it first. Then we'd pour, pour a second glass and have them, have them taste it. Their eyes would get so big. <laughs> Their eyes would get so big just to see how clear the water was. But then, in addition to talking about 
what this filter does for them. Well, first of all, this filter, if you clean it, we show them how to do that too. If you clean it each time you use it, this will filter up to 1,000 liters of water a day for 10 years. So again, the combination of the clarity of the water and that, it's life-changing for them because they're either boiling their water or getting sick or adding some Clorox to their water to kill, to kill particles. So we talk about how this clear water is like God and Jesus. They're pure, but our lives are dirty. We have sins, and the only way to wipe away those sins is that Jesus pay the price for us. Like this filter, Jesus cleanses our lives. We also talked a little bit about how Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice because many of the people that we, whose homes we visited, were part of a religion called Santeria where they do some sacrifices of animals, of chickens. You, we would see, I'm sure there's some pictures in here, some little idols in their homes. So we talked too about how he was that, he was the perfect sacrifice. We asked, we would ask them, uh, you know, what do you, what do you think it takes to get to heaven? And they might say, doing good things, I'm a good person. So then we would take the clean water and say, oh, okay, this is being good. Let's add that. Is the water clean? Oh, you go to church. Oh, you're good to people. The water stays dirty. No matter how much clean water you put into it, the water stays dirty. So that was a big part of our message, too, that you can't, without Jesus, you can't, those sins are always in, in the way. They're always between you and God. But Jesus is that filter that took the payment, paid the price for your sins. So it was really remarkable how many people responded to that simple message. And the illustration to me was, again, like Jamie said, one, one of the best I've ever seen. You're, you're meeting a physical need, and the illustration is just powerful. Um, some of the people who weren't ready were people who did worship those idols, and they were like, yeah, okay, Jesus, that sounds good. I'll add him to the mix. And we had to really convey, you don't add Jesus. He is, he is God. He's the son of God, and you can't have any other gods. So. Uh, uh, Becca, you, like, destroyed one and stepped on it and set it on fire, didn't you, or something? Crush <laughs> Oh, you, you crushed an idol? Go ahead, take a, take a mic. I could tell about it. If go you. ahead, go ahead. So what happened was the first day, um, this was the second house. The first house, I was preaching the gospel. The second house, Miss Becky was doing the gospel. But um, when we entered the house, it was filled with dolls and cigars, and it was completely filled with this um, thing called Santeria, where they worship idols. And, oh, there we go. So, um... When Miss Becky was talking about the gospel, um, the translator told them that you have to let them know that they can't just add it into the mix. They have to choose only Jesus and Jesus only. Like, all of this does not matter, and it, it's pointless and useless. So Miss Becky made sure to get the message clear. She told the people over there that all these dolls, you give it in my hand, I can crush it with my hand. <laughs> And I thought, oh my God, we're going to get like chased down by people because they're going to get angry at us. Because <laughs> she was like firm and confident, and I don't know where she got that power. Like, <laughs> so after that, like after that demonstration where she said, like, if you give these dolls in my hand, I could just crush it. But you can't crush God. You can't crush Jesus. And that that was the point where they really understood what it meant and the beauty of it. And probably why I got so confident after seeing Miss Becky, because if the people did not get angry after that, like, y you get a confidence, you know, and it was not just beneficial for the people in that house, it was beneficial for us, because we had, we learned a lot from her testimony and her gospel way of 
preaching and it was just a, a, an incredibly balanced experience of fear, dramatic and happiness and joy and yeah. That's All the feelings. And so day through five is we, we just distributed filters and gospel. Morning, afternoon, morning, afternoon, rinse and repeat. And uh, like Jethro was saying, as we did it more and more and we saw God moving in, in our weakness, it gave us more and more confidence, not in ourselves, but in the message we are sharing. Because the gospel is the power of God into salvation. And we saw that. And so we went out into the community. Um, you see there's some, some nicer homes and then there's some not nice homes. Um, and, but... In all these homes, you know, a lot of them had these idols. Ben, you want to say something? So we mentioned Santeria. What that is, it's a mix of traditional African idol worship, Caribbean cultures, almost like a voodoo thing. It's a mixture of that and Catholicism together. But they put all this together. So we would walk in and see these idols set up, and they would have, like, dishes set around for little sacrifices and offerings. There would be money in these, and one was a, a statue of a dog with popcorn in front of it. They would have a burning corner where they would have like a little burn offering sacrifice in the corner. I mentioned sacrificing animals. Many days we would be walking the streets and see like, you know, a Walmart bag laying with, <clears throat> that's chicken feathers sticking out of that bag. And it was a byproduct of them doing their sacrifices. We would see people dressed in all white, um, walking around. Right across from where we were staying were these folks that were all in white. And we later learned that they call them their godfather and their godmother. That's their, what they consider their priest and the priestesses. Um, in one house we went to, it was with Becky at the time, we gave the water filter the whole nine yards, and it was all good until she started sharing the gospel. And this lady dressed all in white came and sat on the porch and was sitting watching us the entire time and you could feel the evil when she walked into that porch you could just feel the spirit change and she sat there and watched the entire presentation and even though she was watching the whole time and they had idols everywhere both of those ladies said that they wanted to accept Jesus that day I, I will say that the first place I went to where they had signs of this, I didn't recognize them. It wasn't as dramatic as the dolls with the bowls. It was more like uh, ceramics, uh, a couple of ceramic things, and they just looked like decor to me. So the translators were amazing because they could say to us, see that, see that, and, and let us know what we were actually see, seeing. They and the, told us not to take pictures of the Santeria, so... This is credit to Philip Owens, who can snap a picture real quick. <laughs> take that camera up. Anyway, um, one thing about the Santeria, it's 80% of the country uh, is Santeria. The other 20% is mostly Christian, with Baptists being the largest uh, denomination in that group. But... When you think 80%, not only did they absorb uh, rituals and saints from Catholicism, but they also um, took in certain aspects of Christianity. You could not go in a home and, and first thing out of your mouth when you start presenting the gospel be, do you know who Jesus Christ is? Because according to the Santeria, they have to believe in Jesus I'm not going to say Christ, but, uh, you know, they believe in a Jesus um, before they can become Santeria. So they also have taken in, in aspects of Christianity as well as Catholicism. So it is a very complex uh, group, and they do believe in animal sacrifice, and so it's, it's part of it. The, they do not do voodoo. Uh, Ida told us, you know, it's not, but it's right there at the edge. So it's a very... And, and like Ben said, they would come up on the porch. But then I started noticing our guides, when they took us into the home and introduced us to the people, they started stepping out on the porch to prevent them from coming up on the porch. And so I thought that was interesting as well. So y'all hear all that. I, like, 
I was terrified. I kid you not. I'm looking at these little things in bowls, and like they're looking at me. I, I don't want any part of it. Like I'm I'm terrified. And so, like, sharing the gospel, I, I, I don't want to make eye contact with one of them things. And so, part of, um, so you had different jobs, and we'd split up into groups. And first off, I think that was super cool, because, like, we don't have Sunday school with each other. I mean, I'm not in the old folks class like them. But, um, <laughs> and so, it was really impactful to be able to work with the rest of these people and people that we didn't really have much interaction with and to be able to not only meet them, but to hear their stories, to hear the gospel, hear their stuff. So, but, so while I'm scared out of my Jeepers for um, all of that stuff, I spent, you had four roles, share the gospel, uh, do the water thing, but then there was child duty and then data. And so my favorite thing was child duty because usually there wasn't any children. And so, um, but for these first few instances, there were. And so I was like, oh man, what do I do? I have to do something now. And so I was like, you know what? I know enough trash talking Uno to play a game. And so, um, the first child, um, he, we played Uno, he was like six or something, he was a beast, and so, um, but after his parents had received the gospel or something, uh, he, they were praying, and he was doing this thing, like just bowing, like it was, it was like uh, out of a ritual, and this other little girl told him, um, she was part of the God, she said, hey, you don't have to do that anymore, and I thought that was impactful, something that I wouldn't have been able to see. Um, and then there was this other child, um, and I had met them, and then they, they followed us back. Um, we got back early uh, to the church uh, to wait for everyone else, and um, it, was this one, it was this one kid and his friend. The first kid, he was an orphan. His father had gone to Miami to get a job, and then um, he had said, that he had found a girl in Miami and told his wife and kids, I'm not coming back. I'm not, y'all don't need any money, just not. The wife, a few months later, killed herself, leaving three children, um, ages from eight, 10, and 12. And so the church had been taking care of that family. Um, but then there was this younger kid, um, his name was Bori, and he was a, um, He's, he stuck with me the closest. Whenever he'd see me come around, he'd jump on and be like, you know, it's time. And so, <laughs> but um, that was especially impactful because, like, I'm terrified of their situation. I'm looking at this, and I'm just like, there is no hope. It is so sad to see that. It is so sad to be like, oh, in a, such a poor village, a poor country, a dying country, to see a kid who's happy to play Uno. You are not catching me playing Uno. I'll be so sad in my situations. But I was able to talk. I was able to uh, talk to him. Um, I gave him the Uno cards at the end of the week, and he was just, he gave me stuff that, like, I, he didn't have anything. But he gave me a little bracelet and stuff, and I, I'm going to cherish that forever. But, um the, and then I, my mom can share the story of, um, wait. Uh, it was actually our last visit, and um, the Angela and David and I, we went into a, a house, and um, I did the water situation, and it was, t it, was, it was a tight room. It was kind of tough, and David shared the gospel, and the uh, grandmother and the mother accepted Christ. And this little boy comes in with Uno cards. I said, oh, you know, my son. And Nathan had written him this long letter. And he was like, oh, Nathan, Nathan is yours? And I was like, yeah, that's my son. And it was just like, you could feel the Holy Spirit. Like, a whole family was impacted by, like, by the gospel and having the water. Um, but it was also like we were impacted. Um, I'm so proud of this team and like the youth. This was uncomfortable. Like you're having to eat whatever they put in front of you. Like that's it. You just eat it. You just eat it. I don't know what it is either. You just eat it. And like, you know, and then like the, the water, please put the hand sanitizer on your hand. We've seen what this can do to you. Please put hand sanitizer on your hand. You know, like try to stay clean. But it's like, 
uh, I think that I was just really impressed by the youth because I wasn't sure how this was going to go down. There was a wide variety of ages and life experiences, and you could see the growth in the youth. I mean, this wasn't just about us, but I think it was an unexpected gift for me to watch young people at the beginning of the week, m more nervous, right? You've got these dolls looking at you. You're trying to share the gospel. It's hot. It's uncomfortable. And then, like, you see them grow and sharing their testimony and, um, sharing the gospel more effectively and experiencing the Holy Spirit and trusting in that. So it was, it was a gift for us. And I've been on five mission trips to four different countries. And that doesn't make me a professional miss, missionary, but it does make me kind of critical. And I, this is the best mission trip I've been on because it met a felt need. The people needed some clean water. But it also met a spiritual need and that the gospel was shared. But it was partnered with a church so that it wasn't love them and leave them. They, they had a path forward, and the translators helped us navigate things that we would not have understood otherwise. And the church is continuing, continuing to minister to these people that they'd already built the relationship with. So it was like it was just a great experience. I'm really thankful to have been a part of this team and the patience everybody showed each other. And like, there was no instance, of, or I didn't witness any instance of um, unbecoming behavior. Like the the people really loved each other and I felt like served God and represented our church and the kingdom well. Absolutely. Um, yeah, there's, there's so many stories. We're, we're not going to be able to get everything out at this time, so I would encourage you, you see the faces up here, continue to talk. I mean, what, a, what another great way just for our church to continue to get to know one another. I love that we have all these different ages up here. And... Um, and so we continued to serve and continue to di dis distribute. And, and at first, we, we, we stayed up kind of on the hill, but then we went down to what they called the Wooden City or Stick City. And basically, as you can see this bridge, it crosses this, this river, and this is where a lot of them got their water. Um, I don't know if you can really see all the garbage that's in it. Um, there's actually a guy taking a shower in it at one point as well. Um, I mean, it... It was, this was another level of poverty here. Uh, they call it the stick city or wooden city because a lot of the homes up on the hill are made out of concrete, but here they're just made out of whatever they can find, a lot of it being wood. Um, and yet people here who are in desperation continue to receive the gospel, the good news of Christ. And we continue to share. Does anybody else want to uh, talk about the wooden city at all? Yeah. Sorry, I got the mic. So uh, this picture right here, Angela and I ended up being a team of two that day because one person was sick and another one, while we were sitting there, said, I, gotta, I have to get back to the church. <laughs> um, this couple, we, we met them and the people next door between their houses in a little shaded area uh, because they, they didn't invite us into their, their, their little uh, houses that kind of had sheet metal walls. And the, this man brought out a chair that looked like from the 1970s, plastic uh, seat and metal legs. And, and then he brought out a second one. He said, please sit. And, you know, Angela sat down. And, and then I said, well, we want you to sit. And the translator said, these are the only two chairs they have. And they wanted us to sit in them. The uh, little girl in that picture is the girl that Nathan was talking about that said, you do not have to do this anymore. Um, her name was Valeria, and it was just amazing because what happened was the first day, there was a group that went and ministered to her mom, and her mom received the gospel. And then every day after that, the day after her mom received the gospel, her mom and her daughter were at the church every day. I mean, just the commitment was amazing. And, you know, it was amazing to have these people receive the gospel because what they're told as part of Santa Rhea is that you have to do this, right? Once you do this, if you leave it, you're going to die immediately. Like, everybody who said no, it was out of fear. Like, a lot of these other religions, even false religions, have a false hope. But they didn't have hope. They just had fear. They were just so afraid of death they were going to die immediately if they didn't do Santa Rhea and that was just 
so surprising. And another thing was that after they received the gospel, like the church, they're running out of room. Like here we can buy chairs. There, there's not really any chairs. And when there is, the church doesn't have the money to get the chairs. I mean, they're trying to buy a house for $4,500, which sounds really cheap, but when you don't have any money, it's, it's very hard to buy that. And um, another thing is that when we got back, I know David texted the um, Sylvia, who was the pastor's wife, and she said that people from the trip who accepted Christ, there have been people who have been coming fruitfully and faithfully to the church. Jethro, you want to tell about that one? So this was another house in the wooden city. It, I'll just explain the house a bit. On top, we had a metal sheet protecting from the rain, covered with holes and rust. Bottom, dirt. And the four walls we had, one was a door, two were big windows, two led to another room. And it was just a cramped space, like a four by four space. And there were like eight people living in it, some sleeping on the floor. There was like five kids in it, two, uh, um, the husband, wife, the husband and wife had two kids and uh, they were taking care of three more children who was the wife's sister who was gone to jail and uh, they were taking care of the children. And the children were working hard on getting water. We're like when we entered the house, we saw uh, um, someone my age going and getting like buckets of water. And in this house specifically, Ben did the gospel and I was doing the demonstration of how to use the filter. After I did the filter and um, Ben took over, like a random guy just walked in and I was like, whoa. whoa. <laughs> it was a weird situation. I was like, what's happening? Then Ben asked that dude like, um, what, do you want another filter, sir? And he was like, nope, I'm here to listen to the gospel. And we were like, wow, we, we are making a difference. Word is spreading out. People are coming not for the filters, but just to hear the gospel. And that was like a deep moment for me. But after that, like, after Ben finish, finished his gospel in that house, which was like so poor conditions, like the only way they had any like ventilation was this fan. And have you seen the fans? Like they have a cage on top of them to protect them from touching the blades. It did not have that cage. And you would get hurt so easily because it's spinning so fast. And it's like completely covered with children and all. So we were like, wow, like this is a new low even for me. Like the living conditions were worse than bad. But after Ben preached the gospel, eight people accepted Christ as their savior and they said the prayer and it was a beautiful moment. Yeah, so in all total, we had 67 people profess uh, Jesus as their Lord. Now, we know from the parable of the sowers that not every single one of those might be a true salvation, right? Uh, some of that seed might have fell on the rocky path, thorny path, um, but we do know for sure that some of it also fell on good soil. And, and who knows, maybe all 67 of those professions was good soil. Um, but the fact remains is God did a lot there. A lot in the people of Cuba, we, as we shared, they're continuing to go to church. We're seeing faith and follow, uh, follow up, but also in us as we continue to grow. Um, we are running out of time, but I do want to share this as well. The guides were, uh, they, they knew we were seeing the bad side of Cuba, really the everyday side of Cuba. But they also wanted to make sure that they, they showed us what they loved so much about their home. And so almost every day they had these little surprises that they would throw in. On the first day we went to this fort in Havana um, and uh, I had no idea what was going on. We got these guys, they're dressed up in their Spanish military garb and they had this entire procession and they would go and then they would fire this cannon um, over the, the harbor there, looking over the capital. And so it was just a really, really cool thing that they showed us. 
Um, another and day. Um, real quick, the the cannon firing they did every night at nine o'clock. Um, talking with Ida, one of our guides, she said that was the tradition because during the Spanish-American War, there were these walls all around Havana, and that's how they signified every night to close the gates to protect the city and protect the harbor. Was at 9 o'clock every night, they would fire this cannon. So they'd still do that every night. And Ida and her husband, they live close enough. She says at 9 o'clock every night, we hear that cannon go off. <laughs> yes. And then my favorite part is the gelato. Um, we got gelato. I, listen, when you are tired and you're hot and they take you to this place, listen, I was like Jack. I was really satisfied with that gelato. Um, then they took us uh, to the water. We got this picture. This is Ida, one of, our, one of the main guides. Then they brought us cars one night, uh, and they drove us around in these, these cars. Lon had to have the pink one. Uh, as you can tell, he's really happy about that. And... Uh, then they, they showed us the, the, the tourist area. This is the Capitol building modeled after the U.S. Capitol. Um, it's just really beautiful area. Um, this is the National Hotel of Cuba. Uh, we go in there, you see all these pictures of famous people. Um, they had this band playing, singing, people were dancing. Um, it, it was, this is like a postcard, right? Um, they show you these beautiful things. You think of Cuba and these beautiful cars. And yet, the flip side of it is there's really no gas to fill those cars up. There's not even gas to pick up the trash in the neighborhoods. And so all the neighborhoods were like this. Um, but again, it's a beautiful place. On, on our free day, they took us out to the country. I mean, just look at that. It, it is it's absolutely beautiful. Um, we took uh, horses down to this farm. Uh, we bought coffee and honey. Uh, we had this lunch at uh, this, this farm to table place. It, it was amazing. Um, and then we went native. You have uh, Andrew and <laughs> Jethro there. Uh, Andrew did the, the, the rain dance to try and bring in more water. Um, and, and as you can tell, even just by the way that this time has gone, our focus was on sharing the gospel, meeting the needs of these people. But I'm really grateful for these little extras that they gave us because it, it grew us, at least I know for me, like my love for Cuba uh, even more, seeing how beautiful this place. I'm not talking about the government, right? But the people in, in the country, it's, it's beautiful. And, and more, you know, in, in addition to that, we, we were dog tired. <laughs> we, need, we needed a break. And so, Israel, thank you for taking that picture. Um, finally, on day seven, and I, I can't, we cannot leave without this. Um, this is the day we were supposed to leave, but you see on there, it was also days eight and nine, <laughs> our travel back. Um, but we opened the morning with baptism um, because Becky. Had, had not yet been baptized, and you, we don't have time, but you can, you can talk to her, get to know her. She's an amazing lady. Um, but she's like, it's like the Ethiopian eunuch, and I'm not calling you a eunuch, but um, she was like, here's water. Why can't I be baptized, right? And so um, we um, went the last day. They found us this closed beach. We weren't even supposed to be there, so this is the world's fastest baptism that I've ever done, right? Um, but I want to share it with you because I do believe that baptism is an ordinance of the church. It's something that we do together. And so it's important as we, we close this out that we see all aspects. We see the, the, the despair, the need. We see the hope of the gospel. We see people being baptized. And we even see the change in us. And so you're going to hear, like, rough music in the background. When I say rough, I mean like the quality. Um, you probably can't even hear what we're saying, but this is important for us as a church to understand this is what God is doing, and this is what God has done in, in, in the life of just one of us and Becky. So that here is her baptism. So, Becky, based on your profession of faith, Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord.
She was so excited. She started going down before I had a chance. But God is amazing, and uh, we are all looking forward to getting back home. And but you know what? We all had a good time. There was no complaining. It was an amazing trip. So, it's something I do believe we're going to do in the future again. If you want to know any more information about that, talk to any one of these guys. Um, but let's go to the Lord in, in gratitude right now. Father, thank you so much for this time that we were able to share um, what you were doing and what you are continuing to do in Cuba. But Lord, you didn't leave it there. You, you've done it in us. And I pray that this morning as we just had a short hour to share um, just a, a, a glimpse of what you've done, Lord, that we would be encouraged, that we would uh, want to see you move here, that we'd want to see you take us places, Lord, that we would pray for those that are going, Lord, that we would give so that those can go, um, Lord, that your name might be magnified and um, that people of all different desperations, whether that's physical or spiritual, would come to know the hope there is in Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you for this time. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to take about a 15-minute break and come back for worship.